to hear from Itai Ashlagi, colleague at Stanford, on clearing matching markets efficiently. Yes, thanks for a lot for the invitation. Um, <coughs> yes, I'm going to talk about uh, congestion uh, in marketplaces, but not using prices, really uh, in matching markets. Um, so the, the idea is that uh, there's lots of marketplaces that need matching. Uh, some of them are more centralized, some are more decentralized. There's platforms that uh, today that need a lot of uh, matching activity. And we'll try to understand how can we reach good outcomes using signals and match recommendations. So this is joint work with uh, Mark Braverman, Yash Kanoria, and Peng Shi. OK, so the, 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 and we're going to adopt a very classic setting to think about um, how to reach an equilibrium outcome. This is going to be a, basically a static setting. But what we're going to do is measure the use con communication in order to uh, reach a, um, the equilibrium outcome. So we're going to adopt the two-sided matching market by Gale and Shapley. So there's going to be two sides. One is with workers, one is with firms. And participants, agents, and firms have strict preferences over agents, potential partners from the other side of the market. OK, so there's no transfers here. And in this model, they also introduce the concept of stability. So matching between agents and firms is stable if no firm and worker prefer to match to each other over their current partners. And why stability is interesting, it's it can be considered as an equilibrium outcome in these kind of markets. It's been used a lot in centralized kind of marketplaces, in many school choice systems, in the national residency matching program. Um, in decentralized markets, it's been used to predict outcomes and analyze um, welfare. Um, in general, you, if you're running a platform, maybe you don't exactly get stability, but you want to achieve something that at least is close in order that maybe your participant won't go and find, try to match matches somewhere else. <clears throat> okay, so just a few examples for why is there congestion. You need to communicate with your partners in order to express your preferences, and that's what, and these things can take time. So for example, evidence from Online labor platforms that 10% of job applications receive a res only 10% only receive a response, while there's about 50% of job openings, job openings remaining vacant. Um, so in decentralized markets, it just takes time to tell someone I like you, to invite someone to apply, and so forth. So it might take too much time to find uh, the equilibrium. In centralized markets, we see in school choice system people actually not submitting their entire preferences. It takes might even time to learn about your own preferences. Or in the national residency matching market, there's 20,000 graduate doctors every year, and you definitely don't rank all of them. You need to invite them for an interview, and uh, typically you see people uh, ranking like 15, those that they interview. So in, <coughs> and in fact, there's a puzzle. There's uh, negative results about uh, finding a stable matching. So in order to find, to, uh, to aggregate all the information, the agent needs to, or a, the amount of information agent needs to learn and communicate to find a stable matching, actually in the worst case grows linearly with the market size. So this is a result first by Segala uh, in a really beautiful paper in JET. And then there's the strengthening of this result uh, to randomize kind of protocols. Um, so this is a worst case result um, that you need a lot of communication in order to find a stable matching. So if it's, okay, so that means you need to communicate with a significant part of the market in order to eventually find a, a stable match. So what we want to do in this paper is actually relax the worst case kind of assumption and give impose some assumption on preferences as weak as possible, but still find a stable matching with not too much communication. And, or to help the market using maybe match recommendations or informative signals to, to reach there. Of course, if every, all, everything is known, all the preferences are known, there's no need for communication at all. I can just implement the stable matching. Uh, but we want weak preferences as possible uh, to reach a stable matching with low communication. And hopefully, we'll, through those algorithms or those protocols that are really going to reach there, we'll give some good insights who should correspond with who in order to uh, to better to to get there, and one one type of insight is, first of all, you don't want to people to communicate with each other if there's no chance really to match. Uh, another one is that agents should reach out to easy to get partners and hope that better partners kind of reach out to them. 
Okay, so I'll present the model, the assumptions uh, on, the, on the preferences, but before this, what are we actually measuring? Um, and I'll discuss the, how we get to a stable matching in these kind of models. Okay, so the primitives, we have a set of workers, we have a set of firms. Uh, there's gonna be some state of the world that incorporates the distribution over preferences. Okay, so agents, um, there's gonna know something about the state of the world. They'll be very precise on what they know and what they don't. Uh, one thing we're gonna assume is that agents actually don't know really their preferences, but they have some oracle that answers to them for any subset of workers S, who is their favorite agent among this set. So you can easily recover a list of, of, of who's your first choice, who's your second choice, and so forth of N agents by making N queries to this oracle. Peter, okay, yes. How do we think of D of, D of omega? How, how, what's the so, so, so omega incorporates the distribution and there's some distribution, that's, there's some distribution over preferences and I'll tell you exactly in a couple of slides what exactly they know and what they don't. Um, so right now it's very abstract, yes. Now, um, so agents might not even know their preferences, they need to recover and, and that would be important to measure how much communication or learning is happening until we reach the outcome. Um, agents are gonna communicate sending messages to each other or to a platform. Um, and there's gonna be some communication protocol that is gonna decide who's the next agent that is gonna send the message based on the history of messages and, they're gonna and what type of message. And the, me the agent is gonna send the message based, based also on his private information. What we're gonna measure is really how many calls are we doing to this oracle and how much uh, bits of information are sent throughout the protocol until we find a stable matching. So, um, and we're gonna uh, encode every message with bits, zero, one bits, so if you want us, uh, if there's an agent, if each agent can be represented by log n bits. Yes? Protocol centralized? The protocol? Yeah. You can think about this as centralized, yes. The choice of uh, who gets to send the message, that's given centralized? That's, that's gonna be decentralized, yes. Does that count as communication? For the fact that I look at the entire history and say, now you talk? Yes, that will count as communication. Well, that will count. Yes, but that, the, the decision for? Like the, the, the decision of choosing someone to let that person talk, that does not count against a communication cost. It's, only it's not going to cost against, uh, yes. But shouldn't it count? Because there's coordination in that sense. So I think it doesn't matter if, uh, so it's, it's just another point, okay, you talk now, it just adds another uh, logarithmic okay. number. Because it's succeeded by yeah. a call. Right, but I just feel like this, uh, this pulling of information and sending back into this kind of a choice of who gets to talk, that is a, that is a lot of communication in itself. Right? As opposed to in a decentralized way, like you know, everybody decides whether they want to talk. No, so we don't count this, uh, but I don't think it affects much. Uh, okay. Let's take this offline. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Is this one-to-one -one matching or many-to-one matching? It's one-to-one -one matching, yes. Okay, so here's a one type of protocol that is uh, a variation of the deferred acceptance algorithm also introduced by Gill and Shapley that finds a stable matching. Here's the, this variation. At any point in time, there's, you look at who are those unmatched workers and you pick one of them and he's gonna apply to his favorite firm that he hasn't applied so far, okay? Uh, that firm, let's call it J, is gonna look at his, all his proposals so far or he's gonna keep the best proposal so far and compare the new application I to this tentative proposal and reject uh, the one that he likes uh, less and keep the one he likes more. And that keeps on continuing. You can go on to the next uh, worker that is unmatched until this process ends and you find a stable matching. So this is one type of protocol that uh, as a consequence from the results by Segal et al, uh, then it's gonna take a long time to find a stable match. Yes. Okay, but maybe you can do something smarter than this. Uh, okay, so this is the, this formally this puzzle by, uh, by these papers in a two-sided market with N agents, there exists the distribution of preferences that no protocol will actually find something that, in, that is growing sublinearly in the number of agents. Okay, and what we wanna ask is what is needed in typical markets, so we wanna make some assumptions over preferences. 
Okay, so there's a lot of uh, literature uh, on structure of uh, stable matching in large match kits and also on congestion. There's a growing literature, but for interest of time, I'll continue. I decided to put it there in case one, someone wants to look at the video later. There's a lot of, uh, this is, I think, very interesting stuff developing. Okay, so here's uh, some assumptions on our preferences. First of all, for workers, we make no assumptions over their preferences. They have arbitrary preferences over firms. For firms, uh, the, the, the preferences are gonna come from a latent utility model, uh, where the utility for firm J over worker I has the following structure. It's composed first from some public or systematic score uh, could, that could depend both on J and I, and this is known to I and J. It can also maybe known to a platform that can estimate it. Think about this component as uh, I look at your CV and uh, you know that the job description and so forth and we know that there's some fit. There. There's also an idiosyncratic score or a private score that is drawn from some distribution independently for each I and J and it's unknown to everyone. Okay, the way that you're gonna figure out who you like first and second is using this uh, oracle, okay? So, so the yes. Sorry? The second one just depends on the firm. The, the distribution depends on the firm, yes. So we need some, uh, we need some assumptions on these uh, components because uh, for, if, we don't have, if this is not sufficiently informative, then we can plug the AJIs into the previous negative results. Okay, so those utilities induce rankings over workers, and then we can get anything we want. So this has to be important. And we make the following assumptions. First of all, that the distribution from which it's drawn has a bounded hazard rate. So it's a heavy tail distribution. That means that after looking at sufficiently many workers, there's someone I really like according to this score. Okay. The second assumption is that if you look at the firm J and look at who he likes the most based on the public score and who he likes the less according to pub the public score, this, this uh, range is bounded by some uh, polylogarithmic uh, numbers. Okay, so it, we can't have it uh, unrestricted, again, because it will, um, will go back to the negative result. But this captures a lot of, uh, you can capture with this a lot of vertical differentiation. So, uh, for example, you can, uh, if this is large enough, so for example, even a log, log n, you can find fitness scores such that you have a polylogarithmic number of tiers that everybody agrees on. But you, you cannot have n tiers, but you have, you can, that everybody prefers someone from a higher tier to a lower tier as long as there's not too many tiers. <coughs> Any questions about the assumptions? Okay. So, um, so again, this is not known to anyone. This is known to I and J. Um, yeah. So there's two types of, so I'm gonna present now uh, in the next slide, the protocol that helps you reach uh, stable matching uh, quickly, hopefully quickly. So there's gonna be two types of signals throughout the protocols. One is the preference signals, and think about as a preference signal, I, somehow I know that I really like you based on the private score that I'm gonna figure out, and I'm gonna send you an invitation to apply to this job, okay? Another type of signal is a qualification requirement signal, and here we're gonna, actually broadcast it for free. We're not gonna charge uh, any cost for that. So what is this? Uh, every firm J is gonna have some qualification requirement ZJ, which tells uh, workers you cannot apply if your, if your uh, public score is not at least this qualification requirement, or if you got an invitation for us. That's what's gonna happen. So the whole idea behind the protocol will be to run something like the deferred acceptance algorithm, but to skip a lot of application that didn't have a chance anyway to be accepted. Okay. So here's the, how the protocol works. Every firm is going to start with a qualification requirement, which equals to the public score of the, of the worker they like the least. Okay, and slowly throughout the algorithm, this qualification requirement is going to gonna be tougher and tougher. Okay, so what every firm is gonna do before we run anything that has to do with deferred acceptance, there's kind of a first round. They're gonna bin, the, every firm is gonna bin workers based on only the public scores, which they know, into bins of size one. So there's gonna be up to polylogarithmic number of bins. 
and they're going to figure out who, who are the workers they like the most, the, up to about square root 10 workers they like the most in each bin using the queries to, uh, and send them invitation preference signals. Tell them, you are welcome to apply. Okay? <coughs> and now, you what were, yes? Well, there's a lot of work they did to figure out those preference signals. You're not charging for that. We're not charging. We're every, every call to a, every call to a, to right? yes. So this is not, we're not talking about that. That's, I think, an interesting uh, complementary question. Here, it's every call to the query, to the Oracle, is just one unit. So now we're going to run a sequential version that uh, I presented of the worker proposing deferred acceptance. Every time there's going to be just one worker that proposes. And a worker is only going to propose if he's publicly qualified or he got an invitation signal. And otherwise, he skipped that application and go to the next one on his list. OK, so he proposes to the most favorite one as long that he hasn't proposed to as long as these conditions hold. Otherwise, he skips it. And firms are going to update the qualification requirement over time if, they want, if there's enough people who are publicly qualified that, that applied, they're going to increase their qualification requirement by one each time. So this protocol, what it does is suppresses all these applications that have, didn't have any ch chance anyway to be accepted. Um, and it will find a stable matching with respect to the true preferences with high probability. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the, the first here, and we find a stable matching with high probability, but also the amount of communication is going to be uh, growing at square root order per agent, okay, instead of the linear one. Um, and the idea is that basically if the, what we, you, all you want to show is that when you skip a proposal, you didn't have a chance to get accepted anyway. And you didn't have a chance because if, the, if the, you're not publicly qualified, and this, the firm only increases the qualification requirement is there are a lot of publicly qualified people who applied. And that's why it's going to work. Yes? I mean, so when you fail, do you fail stability? When you're saying with high probability? Right? Yes, you fail stability. I see. So the subset of different acceptance may not be stable. So as the market grows large, the, 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 the form of theorem is the market grows large um, with high probability, probability converging to one, you will find a stable matching with respect to the true preferences. And also this result is tight in the sense that even if both sides have separable kind of preferences, um, you really need this uh, amount of communication per agent. <coughs> okay. Uh, there's also nice incentive uh, properties. I'll skip that. Uh, one limitation of, the, of, this, of this protocol is that it's sequence. Every time there's just one application, it's not happening at the same time. Another is that all these public messages uh, which are from the qualification requirement which we broadcast. So I want to address, to give you uh, uh, just one, uh, uh, to impose a little bit more structure on preferences and hopefully uh, get rid of both the sequentiality and also these broadcast messages. So a special case of kind of separable preferences is the following. Suppose workers and firms are, are we, can, we can put there, there's some kind of a tier structure for each side, and everybody agrees on the tier structure. So that means that every firm likes workers from a higher tier to a lower tier. Okay? But within a tier, the preferences are drawn uniformly at random for each agent independently. <clears throat> and you can have any number of tiers. Okay? So um, the target here, what is the target here? The target here is defined to be the, uh, the lowest, the highest tier, basically, that a worker can guarantee at least as good a worker from or firm from that tier. So this, for example, the second tier here is the target tier for the top tier workers. And for the top tier firm, the first tier of workers is the target tier. So, okay? Uh, so basically, what's going to happen is going to be communication between agents to their target tier. Okay. One special case is uh, when both sides have is one tier, and both sides have just uniform random preferences. And let's suppose there's uh, fewer firms than workers. And um, by a result we had before with uh, Yashka Noya and Jacob Lashno, we know that every firm on the 
on the short side is going to be matched with high probability in a stable matching to one of their uh, top uh, preferences, specifically log square and preferences. What does this mean? This means that you can find a stable matching with very low communication. Firms will say first to the workers that are really on the top of the list, we like you, invite, invite them to apply. And then we're going to run workers proposing deferred acceptance um, or calculate the stable matching that is, is uh, that we take the preferences that are just induced from those signals from the first round. We don't need to consider any other, worker doesn't need to consider any other, any firm that didn't signal him. Okay, because in a stable matching, they will just not match to them. So in one round, you signal, in another round, you just calculate the stable matching, and it will be stable with respect to the true preferences. Okay, you can uh, easily extend this to when you have large, a finite number of large tiers. For example, here there's, let's say, two tiers of firms, one tier of workers. So the signals in the first round are going to work as follows. Those firms are going to signal workers that they like on their, uh, that they really like based on their idiosyncratic, uh, no, here you don't actually know, so you can figure out by calling again the Oracle, who are your top workers that you like. You're going to signal them, invite them to apply, and workers, are going to, at the same time, are going to signal the firms on the bottom tier, also invite them to apply, send them a preference signal. And the reason that they're doing this is that they don't know who is going to match to those top firms. Some of them are just going to left, be left out. So just in case, they're all inviting them to apply. So this is all happening at once. Now you look at all the preferences induced by the signals, either that you sent or received. And you find a stable matching with respect to those preferences. Okay, and that's going to be also work. Um, and generally, you can have any number of tiers. Um, so you, we can have a two-round protocol that in the first round, everybody's just going to send signals to their target tier, uh, not too many signals. And then agents are going to rank uh, partners based on their uh, signals they either sent or received, and we're finally going to find a stable matching based on those preferences. And that's going to find a stable matching with high probability with low, very low communication. Okay, so we get rid of the sequentiality and we get rid of the uh, broadcast kind of messages. Um, <clears throat> okay, just a little bit about how many signals do we really need to send. Here's a little bit of intuition. Um, so on the, on the left side, there's a top tier with 50 uh, workers, 50, low tier with 50, also 50 workers. So what's going to happen here, everybody's sending uh, signals to their target tier. So they are going to send signals to those 50. Those guys are going to send to this tier here. So some of these people will be matched to workers. Some of those firms will be matched to workers here. But those guys, they don't know. They, they can't just take anyone here. Some of them are going to go to better tiers. So we're defining some notion of competitiveness of an agent. So competitiveness of an agent here is going to be higher if more of this is going to, more of these uh, firms are left for them. Less of them, they, are, they have to compete more. So the number of signals that you're going to send is going to be inversely uh, proportional to the competitiveness, to your competitiveness. OK, so the fewer that are left here, the more you need to send signals. Of course, if there's very few people left, then you don't need to send so many. OK, um, just under one exa another example, maybe how to think about this. Suppose you have universally ranked firms, the, the top firm, second, everybody agrees on this. And here's there's the preferences over workers is completely uniform at random. We know that this firm can just choose who they want to match to. But people here on the bottom are going to experience a lot of communication. But on average, we can find something that is, is, has logarithmic uh, communication per agent. But these guys will have a lot. So a corollary from this is that in a two-round protocol, some agents will have a lot of communications uh, sometimes, but, but not too many of them. Okay. It's interesting maybe to find a stable matching with uh, every round, there's not too much communication. And, but there's not too many rounds. OK, so um, let me summarize. Um, so first of all, I think this work is maybe helping to, um, 
to think a little bit about those negative results and, and um, justify maybe stability as a solution concept given those large communication uh, results. So it maybe explains why we can believe in stability. And, but it also, I think, gives some prospective guidelines for matching platforms. Um, so one thing you want to do is really estimate the chances for matches to really occur. And for example, uh, have agents reach down to, to partners to easier to get partners and hope to get um, uh, be reached out from better partners. And we see some, some kind of this behavior in different kind of lab experiments. Um, um, so overall, we, uh, the contribution, we give some assumptions <coughs> on preferences that are um, weaker, the, uh, hopefully weak assumptions that hopefully make sense in some context and that we find a stable matching with low cost of, commu of communication, but also these protocols give a lot of insight of what kind of signals and recommendation we can do in order to help the market reach a stable outcome. What? The? the low cost yes. here was n square root of n per agent. Square root n per agent, yes. And, okay. in, in, the, in, in the general setting, in the, after the slog of it, yeah. yeah. So it seems sort of a bad outcome that the, kind of the most congestion is being created by the, the, bottom? By, by the bottom tier. Um, I was surprised that didn't turn up in your prescriptive guidance. You know, if you, I mean, presumably as a platform, that's not that's not a that's not a messaging equilibrium that would be desirable, right? Yes. So I think we need to think more about what to do in a few we want uh, related to your uh, uh, talk yesterday. How do we want to not leave those guys out and maybe uh, get them involved in? Uh, yes. So we don't have answers to that, but that's definitely. Uh, it's a very well taken point. It's happening with yeah. high probability, right? Yes. Um, can you comment on what happens when it fails? So we don't say what it fails. Uh, 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 so, so, in pra so in practice, I don't think stability is even uh, is a very, we don't have always stability because people, it's also really costly to, to communicate with someone. Uh, so we get approximate stability, but for material, just from a mathematical point of view, it's just uh, um, we don't know what's happening, uh, who matches to who after. So I guess two things can happen, right? It could be that there is a match, but it's not stable. Yes. And maybe I, I buy your point that people will just accept this because the exploration costs. And then there is the there will be unmatched people who should have been matched, and I think that people accept much less. So that someone causes an aftermarket in which they is guys. So what happens in practice? There's those aftermarkets, yes. But uh, either second rounds of deferred acceptance or just random matching, uh, people just communicate somehow. Uh, yes, that's what usually happens. Okay. Uh, well, last question. My intuition is that as n grows large, the noise in estimation of my own preferences is such that you know, strict preferences, my preferences are no longer strict. Uh, you know, there are ties. And I imagine the same thing would be true for firms, right? I'm willing to hire, yes. hire and talk for engineers. I need somebody who's this good, but. Um, so my, my intuition is that the communication will drop if there's more indifferences, but we didn't study this. But just because there's more options and uh, to match with, uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, we did it offline. Oh, thanks.